Hello, I'm Helene Oberman, Managing Director of Interior Design Magazine, and I'd like to welcome you to Product Tour. Energized by a passion to push the boundaries of excellence, beauty, and innovation, for over 50 years, El Dorado Stone has been creating stone veneer that incorporates yet modernizes those qualities first produced by Mother Nature. The focus of the brand is on humanizing spaces and accentuating the connection between the built environment and the outside world. And with their deep understanding of the latest market trends, El Dorado Stone is crafting products right here in the United States to fit the needs of you, the designer. With me today to discuss the brand is Sarah Lagrasso, Director of Marketing and Product Design. Welcome, Sarah. It's really lovely to have you today. Thank you, Helene. So happy to be here. So we are here today to talk stone, and that's veneer, of course. And I'm not sure if everyone is actually familiar with the El Dorado brand. And I love if you could provide us with just a little insight into the history and the mission of the company. Yeah, absolutely. Um, El Dorado Stone is a national brand. Uh, we've been around for over 50 years. Um, previously known for the most believable architectural stone veneer and our latest push has really been like you're saying to kind of humanize the brand really accentuate the spaces where we work play and live every day so you've been with the company for the last 15 years and given your role leading product design of course you've always stayed on top of the latest market trends and I really would love to hear from you, how have you seen the needs of the designer really change during that time period at the company? So I think, you know, design is always ever changing and evolving. And, you know, you're seeing the shifts in design styles, you're seeing the natural shifts that occur in color palettes, but we're also seeing, I think, the shift in how people are living in these spaces every day. and. The, the activities and kind of the um, personalities that are coming out in those spaces are being much more incorporated into the design as well. So of course we're seeing, um, you know, natural shifts with styles and profiles and textures and color palettes, but we're also seeing a much bigger push of personalizing a space and making it, you know, more comfortable or inviting to that person that's living in that space day to day. Well, with your product, of course, there's really no better source of inspiration than Mother Nature. So would you say that you're really capturing what the best she has to offer and modernizing it? I think we are. I think we are. I think I'm confident to say that. You know, I think the human spirit has a, a natural tendency to seek connections with Mother Nature and want to be surrounded by it. I think El Dorado Stone as a brand, as, as a company, does our best to replicate the, the natural textures and the nuances and the characteristics that come from Mother Nature. And then when getting into, you know, developing the color palettes, Mother Nature is the best source of inspiration for that. And we try to incorporate those into the color development. Um, you know, with the design trends kind of evolving and changing to some of these lighter and brighter color palettes, we're, we're not chasing just monochromatic colors. Um, there's, there's natural undertones and currents of accent colors that are subtly involved in the overall color development that still allows the profile to have some movement, some depth, um, and give it a much more relevant appearance um, when incorporating it into your design today. So I would love to know, because especially as we're talking how you're developing these color palettes and of course the texture profiles, beyond Mother Nature, I mean, do you have other sources of inspiration that you really look to that really helps with that development? Um, I mean, absolutely. There's there's inspiration everywhere. You know, it could be a piece of art. It, it could be, you know, absolutely a natural element that we may find outside. It could be, you know, um, a material, a textural material that, that, you know, has a beautiful color palette or, or a beautiful, um, you know, sheen or something to it that we're going to pull from it. You know, we found inspiration based on, you know, personality traits that come through some of these designers or, or, you know, within the A&D community that we collaborate with. So all of that, I think, lends itself into the development and kind of inspiration of products that we're developing. 
So, you know, speaking to the a and community, which you're very well connected with, have you found, especially in this last year, that conversations that you're having with designers and really what their needs are have changed? Absolutely. I mean, I think if you, if we're addressing potentially this last year, you know, post pandemic, I think a lot of the changes that are occurring are surrounding the form and functionality of, of your design in your space. Um, you have a lot more layered elements that are happening when you're talking about, you know, work and, and play all in the same environment. So I think a multifaceted design is what we're seeing kind of come through when people are looking to how do I, how do I design an office that can also be used for, you know, potentially online learning or how do I do a living room that can also accommodate, you know, X, Y, Z, other elements that would be pulled into it. So I think some of the shifts that we're seeing are a multifunctional role in spaces, um, either how to create some separation within those spaces, how to create definition between those spaces. So I think some of those shifts we're seeing and, you know, we're certainly looking, um, you know, to create products, you know, in a sense of what's happening right now where, you know, stress may be over mounting. Um, we're looking to develop products that when incorporated into your space can bring you a sense of calm, potentially a sense of sanctuary, you know, open up, you know, a, a brighter area kind of color palette that might make you feel a little fresh or clean. Um, you know, I think we're seeing little bits of that kind of shift where it's not so centrally focused just on the product itself, but more of how that product is integrated into the overall design of the environment. So, you know, it's come up a couple of times now in the conversation, but of course, sort of one trend that we've been seeing um, definitely over the last year across a lot of different categories, especially in architectural materials, is this like the shift to wider, brighter tones. And so like, how are you seeing how that's being incorporated to some of your newer products? Um, two of which are Grand Bank, Slide and Stone and Lower Valley Rough Cut. Absolutely. I, we've seen that shift coming down the pipeline for a few years. Um, and it's actually, I mean, it hasn't gone away. If anything, it's gotten stronger. I think there's, you know, a natural appeal to something that has a, a, a brighter color palette that can reflect light. It can make a space feel bigger, can make a space feel airier, you know, maybe a little lighter, maybe a little cleaner. Um, it certainly creates a beautiful backdrop to other accents or elements that are gonna be involved in that space to let some of those, you know, furniture pieces or art pieces still take center stage. Um, you know, you're referencing the Grand Bay limestone and the, uh, Lower Valley Rough Cut, those are products that what we were seeing is there was an uptick in a need to want to incorporate traditional stone shapes, such as those. Those are typically traditional stone shapes. And what the designers were looking for is a modernized color palette. So we created these lighter, you know, kind of airier color palettes that are not flat white. They, they have accents, they have grays and rusts and, you know, a little bit of, you know, blondes that are integrated into it so that it doesn't feel so flat. You absolutely still have that tactile appeal, you know, that's going to come through um, with the textures and the color palette as a whole. So it, so it's, you know, aiding in kind of that overall aesthetic of that environment. So white is not just white anymore. So how are you able to really create that depth of color though? So that even that one can't even find in mother nature herself. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the craftsmen that are on our team that are part of the color development, you know, the process is it's layers and layers of coloring within our products. Um, so it's not like you're saying, it's not just a flat white. It's not just white as white. Um, you know, there's, accents and undertones of other other colors that are layered on the products um, and what that does as a whole it is it allows your eye to kind of move across the installation or the application and kind of pick up on some of those nuances and it helps to kind of create a little bit more of a story it helps to create some depth a little bit of personal characterization that you would find in a natural material and I'm just curious because, you know, our audience are designers and designers love process. So how long does it take to really develop something like those deep tones and shifts in color that you can find in the limestone and rough cut? 
You know, I mean, it takes months and months of development. Um, you know, there are some times where we're much more successful at hitting the colors that we want. There's other times that we need to trial and trial until, you know, we as a team feel that we've got it right. Um, but I mean, I think for us, when we know we've got it right, it's a much faster, easier process. There's limits that we have with replicating mother nature. You know, we, we certainly strive to get as close as we can to some of the natural colors that you will find, but we're also pu pushing the boundaries a little bit with some of these more modern and contemporary colors that you may not find exactly the same in mother nature, but to try and meld some of these color palettes together, um, is what is helping us kind of modernize, uh, you know, true color palette that you would find out in mother nature with still hints and touches of, of contemporary palettes that we would see, or we would want to see in, in design spaces. So I really love this like sort of dichotomy then that you're producing. So if you're thinking about Grand Banks limestone and the Lower Valley Rough Cut, which you, you spoke about a little bit is like, maybe they're, they're more traditional texture profiles, but then you're taking these really modern color palettes and sort of bringing it together to make it much more contemporary sort of for, you know, obviously for modern day settings. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you know, there is definitely a need for I, that, that we see from the design community that they want to be able to incorporate a natural material. And I, I think stone is one of the best materials to incorporate into your space. But, you know, you may not want your clean lines, you know, potentially if it's coming off either a little too contemporary or a little too cold, they still want some of that warmth that they would find from a natural material or even just some of the character that you would find in the shapes and textures of it. The limestone and the, the rough cut are beautiful examples of a very traditional profile um, and we were seeing that the more that we were kind of toying with the idea of these lighter, brighter, more modern color palettes, it really started to resonate with that design community. Um, and we were having designers take some of our old, our older profiles and they were whitewashing over top of it because they still wanted that look of that traditional stone, but they just needed a brighter color palette. So, I mean, we've had beautiful inspiration from the design community has led us to this collaboration of some of the new products. And I think, you know, I think it absolutely will be a trend that continues forward. So something else you really touched on um, earlier in the conversation is this idea of well-being. And certainly there's been a greater emphasis on health and wellness of inhabitants within a space. And with that comes sort of this, this push for biophilia and how it's become an even more important design tool that's being utilized with interiors. So, so obviously I know you speak a lot about sort of these benefits of incorporating biophilic design within an environment. Yeah, I mean, I think that topic specifically, I am, I am so eager to speak about. I think I'm really drawn to it because it has such a personal and humanized kind of sentiment to it. Um, we all love being surrounded by nature. I think, you know, if, if you were to ask yourself when you're walking on a beach, how does that make you feel when you are on vacation and you're in the mountains? How do you feel? I think there's indirect natural biology that's happening to us that creates a calm, creates a, you know, a sense of happiness, you know, does it reduce your stress? Do you feel, you know, like you've created a sanctuary? And I think taking all of those benefits and being able to incorporate that into your day-to-day -day environment where it may feel a little bit more hectic, a little bit more chaotic. Um, I think having somewhere that you can retreat back to or even having something that's tactile where if you rub your hands on it, you know, do you have this pinch of nostalgia that may happen that brings you back to a vacation or, um, you know, do, does the color palette, you know, kind of just make you feel good or fresh or, you know, I think the, the biophilic subject is, it's absolutely more important now than I think than ever before. Um, we're a little bit more kind of stuck in our homes and stuck in our spaces. And so to be able to take the outdoors and bring them in and have them provide true benefit to you in your everyday space, I think is, is extremely valuable. Well, definitely. I mean, I'm going to get limestone or rough cut because, you know, don't we all want to be like in Europe right now? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Travel. 
But no, but I love this idea that you keep on coming back to, which is this idea of sanctuary, especially given the fact that, you know, our, our homes have been become so multifaceted, multifunctional, and it's like, you need to work, you need to live and play, like you said, but like, where's our time for like that sort of mental and physical and emotional rest? Right. It's absolutely right. necessary for everybody. Absolutely. Absolutely. There was an article that I was reading that was talking about kind of the psychology of um, clouding in your space. And, and it was saying, you know, with technology now, you know, you're, we're on computers, we're on cell phones. I mean, your eyes are naturally so busy. Um, like you're saying, you have multi layers of things that are happening on your everyday when you think of work and kids and life and things to do and, and whatnot. And um, this article was beautiful because it talked about giving your eyes relief and the trigger that it's almost like a snowball effect that when your eyes have relief, it, it is a trigger effect that can start to affect kind of your heartbeat and it can start to, you know, create a calm within yourself. So, and, and, and again, that touches onto some of these cleaner, you know, more muted color palettes give a natural visual relief um, to your body you know, some of these clean lines that you may see kind of come through, give, again, just relief um, visually. And so I think, you know, some of those things absolutely are going to play a hand in design when, when people are, you know, creating beautiful new spaces. I think they're absolutely going to start looking to how can you create kind of this sanctuary or this retreat that you, that you need to create in your own space. No, I mean, I think we all can admit that we need a little respite from staring at technology and like but better so of course incorporating you know you know we've talked about for biophilia there's the natural light that can help with that but also so incorporating greenery like you have behind yourself or stone which we've touched on but i i know something uh, you know I would love to let the audience know is like obviously your, your product offerings go well beyond the stone veneers and you actually have great collections like something like vintage ranch which celebrates the character of like the classic american barnwood right so it's right like there's there's a lot of different opportunities given what products el dorado stone has in your portfolio Absolutely. Absolutely. And Vintage Ranch is, is the profile that we developed a few years ago and it has been booming. Um, you know, I mean, that barn, the, the, the farm wood kind of barn house look absolutely has been a trend and it's beautiful. Um, and we've continued to expand development on the Vintage Ranch profile. Um, but again, yes, that, that's emulating a, a reclaimed barn wood um, look that you can incorporate into your space. And because it's produced out of a, a concrete material, it lends itself to more spaces that you can utilize it in where you wouldn't necessarily be able to utilize, you know, wood within your, within your spaces. So um, again, and, and, you know, the, some of the characteristics that are captured within the vintage ranch are just stunning. You can literally run your hand across it. You can feel kind of the milling marks. You can capture some of the graining that's in it. Um, it really is a spectacular product to incorporate into any spaces. So it's interesting because the barn one makes me think of this, this next topic that I really wanted to bring up, which is because you know, we're speaking about residential spaces and they've really become highly personalized over, over time, um, especially in the last year, because I think we've spent just so much time at home, but you have this, this ethos that you really like to call, which is lived in luxury, which I think kind of feels like it ties into that barnwood kind of idea. And I would love to know what lived in luxury means to you. For me, and this is probably strictly for me, um, and and I, hopefully someone else resonates with this. I have two kids at home, and my my job, my occupation is is to develop products and develop things that are incorporated into you know beautifying or, or designing a space. And it's oftentimes difficult to balance having beautiful things with kids or with family, uh, you know and I think lived in luxury for me is, is being able to kind of capture both of that. I want to be able to be surrounded, you know, by luxurious elements that are able to kind of create a, a focal point or a showcase, you know, in my home, but I also need it comfortable enough to where I can live 
with my kids and I can live with family coming over and dogs. And so, you know, for me, lived in luxury is kind of the balance of both. Um, it's the juxtaposition of having old and new um, into, you know, developed into the same space. It's taking a deeper dive into what are the textures and the materials that I want to, you know, utilize in my space. I don't want anything that is going to feel so cold or so stark or just too off limits to where it's so beautiful, but don't touch it. Or it's, you know, it's so, it was designed so well that I can't, I don't want to sit on it. Um, I think lived in luxury is, is trying to harness both of those kind of ideas and bringing them together in the same space. So, you know, I think it's, it's really about creating a space that works with you and works for your environment on a design side, but also making kind of the form and functionality of it work with your every day so that you are able to enjoy the space that you just created at any point, you know, within your lifestyle. I mean, I love the fact that it's like, it's, it's nothing is too precious, right? And it's really about this idea of accessibility and comfort. But, you know, as I was sort of thinking about this idea, it made me think of like, is lived in luxury sort of the shabby chic of the 21st century? Right, right. I mean, and, I mean, I think so. I think it is kind of your shabby chic. I think it's, it's absolutely, you know, and this is just my, you know, our coined mm -hmm. term of it. It's not anything that, you know, is out in the design world. It's just a different dialect that, you know, we could put a name to. Um, but absolutely, it's something that, you know, I think more and more people are going to want to pursue, you know, to be able to have nice things and have things that, you know, shine and, and, and sparkle and make your place, you know, everything you want it to, to be, but also carry that personalization into that space. Because, you, you are, you have a life, you have things to do, you have, you know, things that will happen in that space and to be able to make that work in the same environment as, as where you're wanting to, you know, create this beautiful artistic piece. I think it's really important to kind of marry both of those together. So really, you know, for designers to figure out how to really personalize either their spaces, of course, their clients, you know, and to really simplify the specification process, you've created some really great useful tools to really help them figure out what is the best Eldorado product to fit their spaces. Yeah, um, if you visit our website, eldoradostone.com, we have a variety of, of tools that designers or consumers can use. Um, we've got a visualizer space, which is a visualizer tool that you can go in and you can use any of our existing environments and you can play around with different products. You can also upload your own photo and then cast uh, any type of products that you want in your space so that you're able to really visualize what your space would look like in a, in a different, uh, you know, a, a different variety of product options. Um, we also have a ton of mood boards that can show different styling of how materials play together, how different color palettes may play together. Um, and then we also have a very large library of inspiration images that can walk you through a variety of applications with a variety of products um, so that you're able to get a sense of, you know, what is attractive to you. Um, and then once you drill down to kind of the product level, we also have a product selector that's on our website that you can click through and click into the style and get down to a category of style. You can click into the types of lines that you are looking to create um, in a shape, in a, in a texture, and then you can pick your color palettes. And once you've kind of finished that questionnaire, it'll populate some options that are suited for the, the style or the um, inspiration that you're looking for. So a, a large variety of different um, tools that someone can use to kind of narrow in their focus on what they're looking for. No, I mean, I love that you made it really simple and especially offering a lot of the, the inspiration behind so, so that the design community understands it. And something that, you know, we should make very clear too is that, you know, we've really been speaking about residential spaces, but, you know, you have tools and obviously products that actually span both from residential, obviously, to the commercial world as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we've got 
content that is surrounding commercial applications that's showing you know our products that that is being used on on larger applications um, within the hospitality world within you know the multifamily um, within retail I think we've got some great examples on there um, and all of the tools that we're talking about can be used for both residential or commercial so they still lend themselves to both you know, kind of applications. Um, the Inspiration Gallery has a section on there that is strictly commercial focused. And we're always continuing to expand on that library to be able to show, you know, with people the diverse kind of collection of how you can use stone veneer in a project, both small and large, both, you know, residential and commercial. So it's absolutely um, a growing asset that will continue to nurture. That's great. Well, Sarah, you know, obviously today was just only a little a little dive into the world of El Dorado Stone. But, you know, I really would love to thank you, obviously, so much for your time and for the insight that you've provided. And, of course, for our amazing, lovely audience out there. Please make sure to check out the El Dorado Stone website to learn more about their products and, of course, their inspiration and specification tools. Thank you. Welcome to Masterclass. I'm Pamela Jacarino, Editor-in-Chief of Lux Interiors and Design. Today, I'm thrilled to have one of the design world's most talented and fashionable leading ladies, Joy Moiler, who raises the bar when it comes to chic interiors and style, which she has in spades. Joy, it's so nice to be with you today. Pam, it's so nice to be with you. I'm uh, enthralled by your intro. I've never been described in that manner, to my knowledge. So I'm kind of laughing about it. But thank you very much. And it's <laughs> and, I, and I love your, um, you know, your flower and your background always looks so chic. So thanks. Thank you, my dear. So um, this is a master class, and I usually like to take it back to the earliest of days to find out, you know, when did inspiration hit? And for you, it literally, you were literally knocked out by design. Um, at the age of 14, you took a trip to Spain that sort of ignited your love for color, textiles and materials. And <laughs> while you were there, a piece of limestone from Gouda's Basilica literally fell on your head. You were okay, <laughs> um, but but tell us, you know, tell us that experience and and sort of how that started you on this uh, journey that you've been on in design. Uh, at the time, I was really trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life and that sort of thing because my parents, you know, were hurry up and think about, you know, what do you want to do? What do you want to be? And I just, you know, I took this trip and uh, with my family, and we were just kind of strolling about. And as you mentioned, you know, a piece of the structure literally chipped off and hit me in the head. And I fell on the ground. I was bleeding a little from my forehead. So my dad was a little concerned, but it was like, as I opened my eyes and the haze sort of settled, I looked up and I said, this is what I want to do. What is that? You know, I, who's the architect? And I was just mystified by its structure and it's so ornate and so heavily detailed. And it wasn't like any other building I'd actually seen that closely with all that detail. And I was just astonished by it, kind of afraid, but also just sort of recognizing its power and just thinking about it from an esoteric perspective, this is, I guess, what I needed to kind of get a true direction on what my career was going to be, because I'd always been toggling about fashion and architecture and photography. And so it was sort of like an architectural awakening for me. <laughs> it, ser it served you very well and served us well. Um, so you grew up in New York City. You mentioned your dad who worked at the New York Times. Your, your mother was a quilter and a textile lover. And your parents really felt it was very important for you to have this global sense of the world, which is kind of, you can do that living in New York because there's all these you know, different communities and so many different people that um, come from you know, different walks of life. Talk a little bit about how you know, even today you bring sort of a 
global point of view into um, the design work that you do? Uh, well, my dad worked at the New York Times. Uh, he insisted that every night after dinner, we sit around and we read some articles from the Times. And he just absolutely insisted, as did my mom, that we were aware that we were just a minuscule part of what was going on in the world. And he felt it absolutely imperative that we connected with other cultures and we understood other people's lives and trajectories, you know, the pluses and the minuses of daily struggles and wins as well. And every weekend we would, you know, head in the car, we'd go to Little Italy, we'd start in, you know, Lower East Side and we'd have Hamantaschen and some wonderful baked goods that I still love um, mm -hmm. from sort of the Jewish bakeries. And then we'd walk around and we'd make our way to, to Little Italy and maybe have an Italian lunch and we'd stroll around and then we'd make our way uptown and we would have maybe Indian food for dinner. And he just insisted that, you know, the food was a real way to introduce us to other cultures and in alignment with the, the food, of course, you know, we would go to sari shops and look at saris and textiles. And my mom, of course, loved going to the Lower East Side and looking at a lot of the um, fabric houses there. And we would buy yards and yards of fabric, take them home, and she would lay the fabric out on the floor and maybe get a bowl and make a little cutout for like a little sundress. And she would make the most adorable little dresses for us. But that sort of uh, introduction to other cultures is something that always stuck with me. And so sort of a global awareness is something that needed to be part of my life because it's my continuing connection to my family. And it's imperative that I continue to appreciate and respect other cultures. And that sort of just lesson in life has always carried me through. And it's definitely made an impact in my work and being able to travel to other countries and have immediate connection with people and not be fearful and always be willing to engage with other cultures. And I just hope that that's something that more people experience. Yeah, yeah. yeah there, I have two comments on it. You know, one is that, that the global perspective is what quite frankly makes design so interesting. This, you know, just the mix and exposure. And also, you know, I'm a huge textile lover. And you, if you think about textiles and fabrics, they literally tell a story about, you know, culture and history and place. And so I think that's why, one of the reasons why I'm both so fascinated. I just love craftsmanship. And I love the fact that someone made something and they took the time to think about it. Maybe it was something that they set out with a sort of constructed idea about or something that was just fanciful and came together just because. But the idea that someone crafted something to me is just absolutely magical. Yeah, it, 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 it has meaning and soul. And I think we all, you know, we're exposed to so much in the world of design. So when, when something has that innately baked into it, I, I think it makes us intrigued. <laughs> um, I have to talk about, you know, sort of, you know, the story of your um, career because you worked at so many incredible heavy hitting architecture and design firms and fashion houses, uh, to name a few, Skidmore Owings and Merrill, um, Ralph Lauren, John Saladino, Terry Desmont, and you were the US head designer at Giorgio Armani Interior Design Studio. So quite impressive. <laughs> and you, you know, I did some research and you described yourself as being a serial employee and said that you wanted to learn, you know, everything about architectural styles, whether it's modern, traditional, and also really learn about the business, which I, I think is so impressive. I wish everybody felt that way. What are, and this is kind of a big question, but what are some of the most important takeaways when you think about all of those firms that you worked at, uh, Joy? That, you know, what, what are some of the takeaways and things that you learned that are so important to you today? Uh, everything that I learned at SOM are definitely uh, part of the process of what I do today. 
I am a nut for a paper trail, even with all of the technology. Anything that's important uh, is always printed and in a binder. Uh, I've got binders from like 1998 from projects because I'm so fearful of ever throwing away any point of uh, a document that could be a reference material for something that I'm working on today. Uh, I learned at SOM to keep a telephone log. So if I'm on the phone with a client or a vendor, uh, there's a date, there's a time, and there is uh, a record of the question and the solution that was discussed. And someone who, uh, a friend of mine who's an attorney said, oh my God, you would be a mess in a court of law because you have all of these exhibits. But, you know, we have to understand that what we do is beyond design. It is a business and documentation is so incredibly important. And I enjoy the de design aspect of it as well, but I long learned at SOM the importance of keeping a paper trail and being extremely organized. So that's something I learned from SOM. At uh, John Saladino, I learned to be a little bit more fanciful. I learned to sketch upside down because John will do that when he's sitting across the table from someone. At Ralph Lauren, uh, of course, it was the opportunity to work within the fashion house and employ both of my loves of design, architecture, photography, all of it, actually. And I just learned you know, the wonderful ability to go from lifestyle to lifestyle of working with men's fashion and haberdashery purple label one day and going into the world of sport and RLX and then moving to women's, you know, and having that fanciful, you know, white limestone with, you know, beautiful metalwork and just feminine detailing and that you could do it all in the same day. And do it again, you know, six months down the road as the seasons change. So I always kind of appreciated that and just that whole world I loved. At Armani, of course, it was a very luxe environment. Uh, I was able to use some of the uh, textiles from the past fashion collections in my projects. So I would just go mad, you know, with, with the various textiles and that sort of thing. Uh, that was also my introduction to really working with celebrity clients. And it takes a special skill to kind of manage uh, a lot of that and cutting through the fat of the entourage and the gatekeepers <laughs> and really just honing in with the actual client and establishing a relationship outside of the people who get you know 10 and 20% to really just develop a project and a rapport. And that was really interesting. Uh, so I've learned something without a doubt from every firm that I've ever worked at. And I know a lot of younger design students are so anxious right now, especially with the world of social media, to get out there, jump out and start their own firms. And I say, don't be in such a rush. There is so much to be learned from working at different firms. And the beauty I think of what I do now is that I'm able to work on different projects of different styles uh, within different global trajectories and influences because I learned from all those other firms that you can do that. You don't yeah. have to do one thing and one thing only. And that was always the beauty of working with different firms. Yeah, I know. I, I, I feel like it's, it's so interesting to sort of, you know, look at the path that you took, Joy. And I agree with you. I do think, you know, it's because of Instagram. It's like, I'm going to hang my shingle immediately and just get, get into it. But you, you lose, you know, I feel like working at different firms is sort of like a form of continued education and learning. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, you, you really work with some heavy hitting um, firms. So I'm, I'm sure you learned so much. Um, I thought it was interesting after, you know, you know, going to all of these firms, I think it was in, in 2011, if I have my facts straight, you started your own firm, you know, how did you know you were ready? Like, did you, did you, this, it, it, you know, I'm curious to know, like, is this something that you thought about for a year or two, or was it just, you know, did you just, was it more spontaneous in terms of, you know, the, the decision to take that leap? Oh, heavens no. I went 
kicking and screaming. I never had a wish to have my own firm. I just thought I will continue just working for incredible firms. I had a list of other firms that I wanted to work at at some point in my career, you know, and it was actually um, clients while I was with Armani and Roberta Armani, who is the head of worldwide global entertainment. She said, Joy, it's really time. You know, it's time you've got to do this. And I was working on uh, the second project for her ex-husband, whose work I'm actually still working on projects for him now. And he said, Joy, you've got to go, you know, you just, you know, what are you doing? You know, you, you, you've got to go beyond this, you know? And I was just like, no, you know, I literally went cooking and screaming. And one night uh, after dinner, he was getting in a taxi cab and he said, if you don't leave the company, I'm never going to speak to you again. You know? <laughs> And then he closed the door of the taxi and drove off. And I thought, okay, you know, if someone is telling you, you know, it's your time and you can't see it, I really have to think about it. And then uh, it, it, it was just the timing of it all. And I said that I was going to leave and resign. And I was literally there still seven months after I resigned because they were kind of like, no, we don't really want you to go, but we understand it, but we have projects that you're doing. So I stayed on. And for the last, I think, four months of my being at Armani, uh, I was actually starting to work on other projects with the um, blessing of Roberta. And she literally gave me the uh, entertainment um, list of any, you know, to work with any client that I wanted wow. to work with. That's yeah. such a compliment about who you are as a, as a person. And, and well, I was already designer. working on projects with uh, Leo DiCaprio and John Mayer and Adrian Brody. And so it was just a continuing extension of that. Yeah. Um, you know, you have, you know, you mentioned you've got, you know, a, a thriving practice now, very successful. And layered on top of that, you also have, um, uh, Joy Moiler Atelier, inspired by your love of tabletop. Tell us a little bit about, um, you know, this collection. I know you're very much into sort of a lifestyle approach to design. So I wanted you to speak a little bit about that. I have always loved tabletop and dinnerware. And, you know, I would drive my parents crazy because when we would go to dinner at someone's home, I would always pick up the tape, the dinnerware and I'd flip it over <laughs> to see who made it. And my mom was like saying, stop that, put that down. But, and I would just really like hold the plates and, you know, study the detailing, that sort of thing. And so it's always been a love and my mom loved it as well. And I was just, you know, one day kind of strolling around Central Park West and looking at all of the, you know, the beautiful sort of details and terracotta uh, ornamentation along Central Park West. And I was just looking at the Dakota and the Majestic and the Beresford. And I just thought how wonderful with some of these elements that you could barely see be, uh, you know, look on dinnerware. And that's sort of what inspired my Majestic Dakota and, um, Beresford, not a Justic Dakota in Beresford. So it was my first foray into tabletop. I did just a small capsule collection of like nine pieces because I just kind of, I was producing the whole thing myself. I did all the drawings and taught myself illustrator so I could do the drawings for them and produced it and shipped it out and all of this. And I ordered 50 pieces of everything and we just have like four pieces left. Wow. So it's been really successful and we're in production with some new things as well and sort of a restocking of uh, the Beresford group, which everyone seemed to love the most. And I'm just really excited. I want to do more. Um, I just love it. I, was, I, I feel like we need like a Joy Moiler fashion line too, because I know fashion is something and style is something that's just so innately a part of who you are as a woman, as a designer. So I'm just putting it out there. <laughs> I actually, you know, I used to do a little fashion design because uh, I, you know, it was my original love. And I actually designed a dress that Roberta Flack wore at Carnegie Hall one night, which was really, really exciting. Uh, but I decided, of course, not to do that professionally, but it was something that I used to do 
on the side. Nice. So Joy, you, uh, you are just one of the most positive spirits that I, that I know you, you just have, you, you're very passionate about what you do, um, no matter what you, what you tackle, how have you managed to stay inspired? Th you know, this past year, we're all sort of, you know, in front of a screen for the most part and not, yeah. not traveling. Talk a little bit about how you, you know, how you just keep such a, a spark and the the energy that, that you that you put out into the world uh first of all i'm glad to be alive uh i you know i say a silent prayer every night for those who are no longer with us since past year and for the families of people who were unable to be with their loved ones during this tragedy uh but i you know i just i've always worked even during the pandemic, when things shut down, I found something to do, whether it was painting or sewing or anything. But your Instagram, your tease with joy, which I'm just going to say you invited me to be a part of that. We're going to be doing that. Yes. I'm so excited. <laughs> yes, yes. And my high tea with joys, you know, I just, they're infotainment to me, information and entertainment. And I just thought during this pandemic, you know, everyone's going crazy and so stressed out about, oh my God, what's going to happen? You know, let's just kind of relax for a few minutes. Let's have a, some fun. Let's talk to people that we don't often have an opportunity to meet. Let's enjoy it. You know, learn a little bit about people's trajectories, what they're up to, what they're doing, and not be so serious. So I just started out doing high tea because I'm all or nothing. And I said, I'll do it Monday to Thursday and I'll do it, you know, it'll be four days a week for an hour maybe. And then I realized, okay, let's do it again next week because people were like, oh, I'm interested in coming on. I'm like, okay, so we went into week two, then it went to week seven, four times a week. And then I was exhausted. <laughs> and then I said, oh my goodness. This is really taking up a lot of time and then work started to ramp up again. So I wasn't able to do it as frequently, but I'm happy to have you. I know I'm so, I'm so honored because I've watched, I've watched many of your high teas. So I need to, I need to get my mug and tea game on. I, yeah. I can't remember when we're, when we're going to be doing that. It's on my calendars, but I'm really, really excited. Yeah, but I'm looking forward to that as well. And the other thing, just to stay positive, I crank the music up and I dance. <laughs> I will dance till I pass out. You know, I just, it's just a way to, you know. Yeah. Relax. And it's also, you know, the, it, it, it is, it's such a weird time, but it's also, you know, a moment in, in time that in some ways we won't, we, we, we've had a, like a lot more time on our hands for those of us who are traveling and, you know, you're busy with work and you get, I, I have talked to so many people and you feel like, you know, you're just, you know, on, a, on a, any given day, so caught up with your calendars and your meetings. And so I feel like this last year has been a period of time, it, you know, with, obviously it's, it's scary and it's tragic and all of that, but there's also an element of sort of, you know, being present with yourself. I think for some people, they like that. And for other people, they do not want to be present. It's a little scary. It's like, okay, well, how am I going to make the most of it? But it's a time for a lot of creativity, I think, as well. Yes, and great reflection. Uh, but yeah, I mean, my creativity is just kind of zoomed. Because, you know, when you're at Gritnet and you're just getting things done, you think, oh, I'll wait to the weekend and then I'll paint a little bit. But then something else always kind of creeps up and you don't get a chance to do those things. And so it's been a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to get the brushes wet, you know, and sew a little bit and design dinnerware. And exactly. All and my last question, because you're, yeah, I have to ask you this because you're just, you know, you, you, you have an eye and you're, you're very passionate again about, about design and, and so many aspects. Is there anything, you know, that, that's sort of on your radar now, uh, design wise, something that, you know, it could be a textile or tableware, anything that sort of you're, you're focusing on um, that, that you want to share with us? Yeah, I mean, I'm continuing to do uh, Joy Moiler Atelier, of course. I'm um, also uh, looking at um, linens for the tabletop and working with a company in Venice and uh, getting some samples together, some which I have here and I'm so excited <laughs> about. 
and just kind of growing that. I'm also working with the expert, which is a great new platform of interior designers with Michelle Nussbaumer, right. and Martin Bullard. And that's Nick Jake Arnold's, right? Jake, Jake Arnold's Arnold started yeah. that. Yeah, that's great. And I am having so much fun with that. You know, I'm doing these hour long consultations and it's a great opportunity to really kind of work on different projects every single time for a concentrated hour. And I'm just, I'm loving the whole platform and the process. And it's the easiest thing in the world. And Jake is just fantastic. And I just wonder why wasn't this, you know, established before? So for anybody watching who's not familiar, I will let you know, it's called The Expert, where they've got, you know, amazing A-list designers for any consumer that wants to book sort of a video consultation. So you can go onto their site, you can consult with Joy, there's designers from across the country, and it's a wonderful, um, you know, platform. So check it out. <laughs> Check it out. Well, that's so exciting, Joy, and I know I hope to see you um, in Palm Beach and act like IRL in real life. So that will be really fun. Well, Joy, thank you so much for being on um, our masterclass program today. It's always um, great to see you and have your words of wisdom. Pam, thank you so much for having me. I am absolutely honored and I look forward to seeing you next week in Palm Beach. Sounds good. Mwah. Wow.